In October of 2012, the NBC Sports Group acquired the exclusive rights to broadcast the Barclays Premier League in the United States. With their first broadcast in August 2013 of the Premier League, NBC brought football to a new level in the United States. Recently, World Soccer Talk had the opportunity to tour the NBC Sports Group studios, visit with NBC Sports Talk personalities, and to get a behind-the-scenes look at how the Premier League is brought into our homes every weekend via NBC Sports. Fifteen. Oh, we're coming. Ten seconds. Six to Jim. Five, four, three. The second half of Cardiff Everton is on the way. It's goalless at the break. Is the pressure on Everton because they've only they've only picked up two draws so far this season? I think it is. If they were to lose, it'd be two, two, two draws and one defeat. Wouldn't be a great start. And I also think the problem with Everton, and I'm thinking about that dressing room, is that you know, we played in teams where the centre forward isn't scoring goals as well as you do. You're looking around and thinking, we're a bit blunt here. We haven't got somebody who can take chances. Like Negredo came on from Manchester City. Everton haven't got that player in the ranks. I agree with you that the pressure's on Everton. I think that's a problem for part of City. I think the fact that they're, they don't have the energy that they did against Manchester City, maybe a little bit of a hangover from that result, the fact that there isn't a ton of pressure on them right now is tough. Okay, let's return you to our commentators, Tony Gale and Gary Taphouse. Rebecca Lowe, you've been a bit of a trailblazer for women uh, covering football. Uh, tell us a little bit about how, what got you into the sport, why you developed this passion and love for the sport. Well, I blame my dad for getting me into it. Um, when I was nine years old, he took me to a match, um, probably because my brother couldn't go and he thought, oh, I'll just take Rebecca. Um, little did he know that I would leave that game, it was Crystal Palace against Everton back in, I think, 1989. And from that moment on, I just loved football. I don't even think it was that great a game that day, but I loved football, it got really under my skin. I can't really remember developing such a huge love for it. It just, I think it just grew organically, really. Um, throughout my teenage years, I was a season ticket holder as well. And it's just always been a part of my life. I can't remember a time when it wasn't a part of my life. You're familiar to American audiences having worked with Satanta uh, when it was on here in the States. And then ESPN, uh, you spent a couple summers here doing Women's World Cup and the Euro 2012. Talk about how that experience uh, helped you understand the American audience. It helped me hugely. When I first did the Women's World Cup, it was my first time on American television. We went over to Germany to do that. And it was so new. Everything was so new. The Obviously the audience and what they needed to know. Um, and also the way of doing TV, the way you, know, you guys in America present television, the amount of advert breaks in comparison to England, the length of them, the vocabulary, the terminology <laughs> used. It's all so different. That was a real shock to the system, I have to say. It was a real learning curve. Very, very tough. The following year, Euro 2012, last summer, uh, it was a bit easier because I'd done that that, that summer in Germany. Um, and so therefore having those two summers definitely helped me with coming here because I knew a little bit what to expect. Um, I think that the appetite though for football over here has grown even in the last couple of years. Um, so that's helped as well because I know that there's an audience out there who are interested. Since you got involved in covering the sport on television, there's been this explosion, not just here in the States, but internationally, Asia, Africa, watching the Premier League. Uh, uh, how does it feel to see your league, uh, the Premier League, your English, uh, explode like this uh, globally? Yeah, really, really proud. I mean, it's always been a part of me so to and part of my life. So to see it now is such a huge part of so many people's lives and pretty much on every continent in the world. It's a great export from Britain. Um, it's, a re it's really proud. I think we, at the moment, have the most entertaining league. Whether or not it's the greatest standard, that's up for discussion, isn't it? But in terms of entertainment every week, there's a few better places to go. So yeah, really proud of that export. Rebecca Lowe, thank you. No problem. Now, with it being a long season, I mean, it's a, it's a long weekend, right. a lot of time. In, any thoughts about fatigue or kind of, you mean, just how, how do you keep, keep it fresh and kind of look at longevity, that endurance? I think, I think you have three things to worry about. You have fatigue, mm -hmm. you have it becoming stale because you're doing so much. Right. And the third factor is, is uh, what you have to worry about is making sure you maintain that high level of production. Right. It's easy to do big games, it's easy to do opening weekends, it's easy to do Labor Days. Sure. You know, it's, I'm sorry, Labor Days, um, Boxing Days. Yep. It's very hard to do 
a nil-nil all four games at half, mm -hmm. 10 o'clock window, and I think that's the challenge. But the one thing you do is you hire people who take a lot of pride in their work and a lot of, sure. a lot of pride, and that goes from all the way up, right. and the talent as well. And you have to find that balance where you don't push too hard, and part of that is not bringing everybody in so early. Right. Part of that is getting real breaks during the week, yep. and part of that is, is continuing to set that standard, and I think that self-motivation that everybody has, and it starts with the talent, starts with our bosses, starts with Sam Flood, right. continuing to push everybody around. But I think the most important thing is everybody loves their job. Mm -hmm. they, this is so much fun for them. This is so exciting for everybody. And I think that that kind of self-motivation is, is, is all you need. Kyle, you had one of the most promising U.S. soccer careers uh, about a decade ago, cut short by injury. And then you thought about taking some time away from the game. What brought you back to the game and what made you want to be a commentator? Yeah, it was funny. You know, the, the way my career ended and, and uh, you know, being on a trajectory where I thought that, you know, a World Cup was in my future and all these wonderful things to have taken away from you because of injury and, and to have the, the game taken away from me at 28. I was so scared that it was going to be heartbreaking to be close to it again. And uh, I immediately just chased it away and got as far as I could from the game. And um, I, I was asked to cover uh, an LA Galaxy game. And I thought it would be a one-off thing. It'd be fun to see my old, my old teammates, my old friends. And being in the booth, being close to the field, I, I became a fan again. You know, I found that love that I initially found that caused me to become a soccer player in the first place and felt a little bit of that buzz that I felt when I'd lace the cleats up and would walk through the tunnel. So I knew I was on to something. And the fact that, uh, that, that I had a sort of a, a lucky start where it went well and got asked to keep doing it, I, I found what my relationship was going to be with soccer, hopefully for the next 30 years of my life. You then go to Fox Soccer Channel, you, you, you launch a show which gets criticized. There was a, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was which a quick, it should have. <laughs> yeah, quick startup, it, was, it wasn't maybe ideal. Yeah. Uh, how did you take that experience and then become this premier commentator uh, for, about Premier League and MLS, uh, taking that experience and then growing as a commentator to one of the best? Yeah, you know what, it kind of goes back to what you said before about my playing days. You know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't the biggest, I wasn't the fastest, I, I wasn't uh, always one of the best players on the team and I had to really work hard at it. And I've kind of applied that same skill set to being a commentator and uh, there's so many things I can get better at and I found that immediately when you get that sort of instant feedback of social media or your friends and the guys that are still playing that watch the games and give me a text or I talk to you afterwards and to have something that I, I was passionate about like I was about playing the game of soccer that I'm so in love with and now have something that I can build at, where I can set goals for myself to cover World Cups, to cover Olympics, to do all these things. And, and it's just like as a player, I need to get better in so many different areas. And to be able to call on that same skill set that I used to become the player uh, I was, it, it just felt so natural. And uh, I'm just so lucky to get the opportunity to be able to, uh, to have something that uh, is a skill and, and a passion that I constantly work at to get better. You're constantly showing off your knowledge uh, on air and making some uh, incredibly spot on points about different Premier League clubs and, not, and clubs that are not uh, in the top six, clubs that are newly promoted. How much research did you do this summer and how much time did you put into watching matches? Because you've got a vast array of knowledge about it, every team it seems. Yeah, my, my wife can't get Real Housewives or the Beverly Hills taped anymore because the DVR <laughs> is all English Premier League. Um, you know, I grew up watching the league, so I've always had one eye on it. Um, but, you know, to be the analyst that you need to be and the fans deserve, you really need to put in that work. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't putting the work in when I wasn't covering Premier League, so I had a lot. I really had to engulf myself in, in the league. Um, even once the announcement came and we found out we got the rights, I already had sort of started going back and watching a video from last year, doing some research. And we have such an incredible research team at our disposal. And um, I basically, you know, in the preseason, while the guys were running and, and throwing up and getting fit, I was kind of doing the mental version of that and just, you know, almost studying for, for a final, just to make sure that the, uh, the fans got the level analysis that they deserve. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Robbie Earle, you played with Wimbledon, mm. one of the most international teams, one of the most exciting teams uh, in the history of the Premier League. Mm -hmm. How did that help prepare you to understand what an international audience would want in Premier League coverage? Um, I think the thing that stood out about Wimbledon is we were pretty much as, we were, as you saw us, we were transparent, we were authentic, we stood up for, for the rights of every underdog and I think that the league's a little bit like that in many respects. I think people like to see how pure it is, I think they like to see the pace, the intensity. It's great sometimes when you know a Cardiff City of, of the world will beat a Manchester City with all their money. 
those are the things I think that buy people into the Barclays Premier League, probably more than other leagues in, in, in and around the world. Do you think uh, playing with the group of players you played at at Wimbledon, the gang, the yeah. crazy gang, uh -huh. at Wimbledon helped you understand uh, the supporters and, and, and fans and how to connect with yeah, the audience Yeah, because more. we were more in touch with fans and, and you know, uh, people who were close to the club than, than most teams. You go to Manchester United, players are taken from the tunnel, put in their car, they fly home. When you're at Wimbledon Football Club, you walk through the supporters and the fans. So, listen, if you haven't had a good game, somebody's going to be telling you in your ear. And so that kind of, of, of closeness, that kind of attachment made it real and also kind of made you realise how important the game was to, to people who were watching. You played internationally for Jamaica. You've mm -hmm. seen the growth of the game here in North America. T t tell us a little bit about your feelings about seeing this explosion of uh, interest in the Premier League and football in general well, in uh, the United I've, States. Since I've been in the US, it's three years. The game's just grown bigger and bigger. And, and it's funny now because I, I've, I've actually gotten a few yellow cabs and I'm li likening this to black cabs back in England. But I'm getting in yellow cabs and people are telling me, Oh, you into soccer? Oh, I'm now a Tottenham fan, or I'm now a Newcastle fan, and, and people are finding a team and finding an identity, and I think that's the key thing. People are now really starting to buy into what the Barclays Premier League is, is all about. Six to your mic. Five seconds. Four. Three. It's half time at the Cardiff City Stadium in our second game of the day. Goal is at the break between Cardiff City and Everton. And I'm afraid to say it's not really a goal fest around the country elsewhere. The top of your screen, Manchester City earlier beat Hull City by two goals to nil. It is goalless everywhere else. Let's though have a look at the Geico first half highlights from our game at Cardiff. What a few talking points. And Robbie had a couple of chances for Everton's Kevin Morales in quick succession in that first half. Yeah, again we've seen Everton dominate the match. Morales we picked him picked him up there. Free header, twelve six yards out, doesn't hit the target. Again Yelovic gets himself in a wide position. We'll pick up Morales again coming free, six yards out from goal. You have to be hitting the target. He runs in there, great position. That's just poor technique and Everton need to find somebody who can finish these chances having so much possession. Well, they found someone who broke through with Baines, who was bright in the first half, and you know maybe the referee suggesting that Leighton Baines is headed to the ground before the contact's there, but there's definitely a little bit of contact. For Medell, this is very risky to put your foot out like that. That's a penalty for me. 